All right, hi everyone. I'm Steve Pavlovsky from Liquid Light Lab. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, today we're going to talk about the evolution of Liquid Light Show technology from the 1950s to present and also offer some thoughts and ideas for the future. Uh, I'd also like to thank my lovely producer and fiance Elizabeth Candela, who's here today helping me out with the show. So, what is a Liquid Light Show? A liquid light show, or liquid projection, is most well known for being a big part of the psychedelic rock and roll shows of the 1960s. It involves the use of colored oils and liquids, which are used to create visuals in real time and work together with live music to create a synesthetic experience. While the liquid light show is the most memorable component of these light shows, it was often used in tandem with a variety of other lighting and projection tools including 16 millimeter film loops, slideshows, Lumia, and the optical manipulation of light and visuals using, using modifications like warp and color wheels. The psychedelic light show is a broad topic with a deep and rich history. And as you can see from some of these slides, there were some pretty interesting rigs and pretty interesting things that were done. Um, but today I'm gonna to discuss mostly the liquid light show part. As we'll see later on, the same tools can be applied to a variety of live analog visuals. I think one of the most important and appealing aspects of this medium is that it's performed live and gives the artist a way to create kinetic Im imagery in the moment and treat the performance and light show as a living, breathing thing. Let's just, let's just go through some more of these slides and just show off some of these rigs here. Um, this would have been single wing turquoise bird. Um, this is from... Uh, we get Baby Maker. Yep, here they are again. Uh, this is the Joshua Light Show from the Fillmore East. Uh, this, I believe, is the Joshua Light Show also. Um, and this was a collaboration uh, between uh, Pablo Light Show and um, a light show on the West Coast. Um, but my focus today will be on the use of the overhead projector and liquid light shows. And there's several ways to do liquid projection, uh, or the wet show as it was known back in the day. Um, and in Europe, the artists used slide projectors, which would put liquids in two inch slides, remove the heat filter, and actually boil the slides. Or they would come up with attachments such as slotoscopes or bubblers that would push air along uh, through the slides and create artwork that way. Uh, one of the famous artists of that era was Mark Boyle and Jonah Hill, who uh, worked in this medium. And they worked with bands such as Pink Floyd and uh, Soft Machine and uh, worked over at the UFO Club, which was um, sort of like the counterculture counterpart in England to us. So, my, so in the U.S., though, the dominant approach to the wet show was using the overhead projector. The overhead projector is basically a slide projector turned on its side with a mirror added. This creates a large flat surface which makes it easy to pull media on and off and it's especially useful to liquids because gravity can be used to contain and keep liquids in place as opposed to slide projectors where the fluids are constantly being pulled down. Um, so now let's just talk about uh, the use of liquids on an overhead projector and where they came from and uh, discuss some of the pioneers of the art form and explore how the technology has evolved over time, some of the milestones that were done, and to where we are today. So the first person to have used an overhead projector for liquid projection was a University of California art professor named Seymour Locks, seen here. Seen here. He worked in the mid-1950s. Uh, his inspiration actually comes from earlier German Bauhaus experiments in the 30s, in the 1930s, where sealed liquids were put in containers and light was projected through them. He gave some demonstrations and lectures on his ideas, and one of those lectures was attended by Elias or Elias Romero. While Seymour Locks seeded the idea of this medium, it was really Elias or Elias who began experimenting with it and developed a few of the techniques most notably the squish plate. Elias was of the beat generation and many of his performances were accompanied by spoken word. He worked in San Francisco in the early 1960s and one of the venues where Elias performed that was the Tape Music Center, which I'm sure many of the folks working in experimental audiovisual art today might be familiar with. 
This is a place where, uh, let's say, Morton Subotnik also started making his synthesizers and things like that. Um, around this time, another artist named Tony Martin also began experimenting with liquid projection, uh, also working in tandem with sound artists. Um, and he also worked at some early um, events in San Francisco, such as the Acid Tests and uh, the Trips Festival. Here's some of his artwork that we can see here. Um, and another uh, very early pioneer is Bill Ham, uh, who we can see here. Um, Bill Ham is probably the person who's most uh, responsible for starting what's called the psychedelic light show. He brought this into the rock and roll environment. Um, here's Bill and some of his early photos. And Bill would, you know, really start using a lot of overhead projectors, and that was sort of his primary medium, and he considered it light painting. Um, here's Bill again. Here's Bill again with a joint in his mouth. Um, and so by the mid-1960s, the rise of the counterculture and so-called hippies uh, began taking place. Rock and roll music, LSD, and a general sense of dissatisfaction with the status quo was on the rise. New forms of expression and experimentation were flourishing. Happenings, gatherings, and acid tests began taking place. And these events moved from coffee houses and small meeting spaces to larger halls and auditoriums. This was a perfect opportunity for light shows because lighting for these types of environments and performances uh, had not yet been invented. In many cases, the light show was not only there for creative input, but also there out of necessity because there literally was no other lighting. Multimedia and immersive projection, visuals, and lighting design was born. As mentioned earlier, it was not only the overhead projector, but arrays of slide, film loops, and manipulated light that began to fill the screens and walls of these venues. Artists like Glenn McKay, seen here, and Jerry Abrams be began adding color wheels and other effects to their overheads. They became staples at San Francisco venues like the Fillmore and Avalon. Other light shows like Ben Van Meter, The Brotherhood of Light, and Little Princess 109 were also doing shows. The medium began flourishing and it also began to spread across the country. There's a few more of Glenn. You can see here is also using slide projectors uh, along with the color wheels. Um, but here we have a, uh, one of probably more significant, most significant meetings uh, in this art form. You have on the East Coast, you have a meeting between Glenn McKay and Joshua Lightshow that happened while Glenn was on tour with the Jefferson Airplane. The meeting with the Joshua Light Show would prove to be invaluable to the evolution of the art form. Legendary rock promoter Bill Graham had just opened up the Fillmore East in New York City and wanted a West Coast style light show at all the concerts. The Fillmore East also had something that none of the West Coast shows had. A permanent rear projection set up behind the stage. Unlike the California shows where the artists would have to load it on Thursday and be out on Sunday, the Fillmore East provided a fer fertile, stable ground to experiment at. The Joshua Light Show would go, go on to develop the psychedelic light show in leaps and bounds and raise it to a level of sophistication not seen in other light shows. So here's a few shots of them. You can see this massive setup that they had behind the stage and the platforms that they were on, and that was there all the time. They, they actually had a dark room on site as well. Here's some classic Joshua Light Show stuff. And here's a classic picture with Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention with JLS playing behind them. Now, while the so-called hippie era and counterculture was in full swing in the 1960s, by the early mid-1970s, things had changed. Rock and roll went from halls and um, um, it went from, from halls that only had a couple of thousand people to arenas of tens of thousands. Uh, bringing the complexities and fickleness of an experimental light show uh, on the road to these types of venues was logistically prohibitive. Also, the evolution of stage lighting introduced the Verilite, which was the first moving head projector and pr precursor to what we mostly see in concert lighting today. On top of that, cultures and attitudes changed 
free love and hippies were no longer in vogue and the light show went underground and actually if you can go back to the slides i forgot to show this one this is one of my favorite photos this is bill ham and joshua white um, at the san francisco exploratorium um, at a show that jls went and did there a few years ago uh, and I just love this photo. I love seeing them two together, and I think the way the lighting and everything, it's, it's a fantastic photo. Um, so anyway, so while uh, not as popular and prominent as the light shows were after the 70s, uh, artists like Jerry Abrams and Glenn McKay kept the medium going and introduced it to a new, <coughs> a new generation of West Coast artists. Folks like Donovan Drummond and Reed Baynolds learned from the masters and would continue to do shows through the 80s uh, throughout today. And the Brotherhood of Light would also continue. And while pure analog and overhead projection had a hard time competing with bright concert lighting, there were a few modified projectors made. And I want to uh, take some time with these next slides uh, to talk about some of these. So here we have uh, Chris Zmanovich from the Brotherhood of Light with this crazy, I don't even know what this is. He's got this crazy lens on top of it. He's got a super bright uh, light source underneath it. And this was a modification they did to go into a brighter, uh, and to, you know, to make the light show brighter. Here we also see a rig from Brotherhood of Light um, called Baby. Uh, baby named ironically because I think the whole thing weighed several hundred pounds and this was also a modification and this rig was actually also featured in the Doors movie in 1991 where Brotherhood of Light did the light show. Uh, here we have Joshua Light Show's so-called big rig and this has been around since the 1960s going back to the Fillmore uh, and this at one point point used airplane landing lights and the lights were so hot that they would actually boil the liquids uh, from beneath. Um, here's another shot of the big rig. Um, this is actually uh, one of the more recent shows they've done. You can see the digital projector in the back. Uh, here's animatronic running the uh, working on the big rig. Um, here's another member of Joshua Light Show. And but not to be outdone there also on the, um, uh, in the United Kingdom, we have the Liquid Light Orchestra, which is uh, Sid Fossil and Peter. And what they did is they modified panty projectors, which are these big uh, theatrical projectors that use big like two foot glass slides to project uh, scenery uh, you know, for, uh, for, for theatrical performances. But you can see what they did here is they turned them on their sides and added all these lenses and they were able to get some really bright stuff with this um, and here's some of the results this was actually uh, Sun Ra Orchestra uh, performing uh, over in England um, so but so while you know light shows kind of hit like a dark time dark ages whatever you want to call it in the 80s by the early 90s uh, things started to change uh, not only the light shows start coming back due, due to the emerging rave scene, but the introduction of the visual presenter came into play. Uh, using the principles as an overhead projector, you can see here in the slide that uh, you have the same principle. You have a transparency and you have a light source underneath and it's passing light through something and instead of a lens, you have a camera at the top. Um, and so you can take this camera now and send it to a video screen or a video mixer or connect the liquids to uh, other analog devices, including VCRs, other visual presenters, and effects boxes. Now, among the pioneering artists who used the visual presenter uh, were the Brother of the Light, who took their show on the road with the Allen Brothers and worked with the band continuously for the next 20 years. Brotherhood of Light is uh, among the most responsible for keeping the Liquid Light Show alive and keeping the San Francisco tradition alive during this time. I mean, they did shows for 20 years uh, all over. I mean, this is really remarkable that they were able to do this. And there have been very few people who've been able to make a career out of doing uh, this type of artwork. And they really went ahead and, and killed it. Um, here you can also see some of the other analog devices I'm talking about. You got that, uh, you got the V4 there. Um, you also see the, uh, the, that, uh, that chaos pad, which I believe there's only was like 2,000 of them made or something like that. You can see the lighting console. And you also see the beginnings of um, some laptops being used. 
Um, here you can see the Panasonic video mixer on the right. This is, I believe, a shot from the uh, Jones Beach Amphitheater, maybe, if I'm correct. But anyway, oh, and I wanted to show this slide here. Uh, up in the top right, you can see the Elmo EV500 AF. This shot is from the OJ trial, and uh, the EV500 AF is my favorite visual presenter, as we'll see later on in my demonstration. It does some really neat things, and it was a uh, it was a central uh, tool used in this um, uh, famous debacle of a trial. So let me go and talk just a little bit too about um, you know after in the 90s and the 2000s where we saw the beginnings of accessible computer technology and the use of VJ tools for projection. Now, while lacking live, the uh, live organic feel of liquid analog uh, shows, the idea of doing live visuals in tandem with live music was still there. The use of pre-recorded clips was possible, um, as was the ability to manipulate video on the fly. Um, but it was mostly limited inside the computer and lacked physical external inputs. Soon enough, however, the ability to capture video into a computer and the, advan and the advent of HD video mixers allowed high-resolution cameras to become part of the light show again. Uh, in addition to projections, which could now also be sent to video screens and video walls, um, this, the, you know, the addition of using other screens and video walls in addition to projections also changed the dynamics of the game for live visuals. Because an earlier problem with traditional projection tech was that overhead projectors and early digital projectors were just not bright enough to compete with stage lighting. But now with brighter projectors and use of video walls, visuals could cut through. Um, so I'm going to go and talk a little bit about my work and two other artists who, um, who I admire, whose um, really uh, their, their technical uh, approach to this is really cool. So let's start with my stuff first. Uh, I began doing visuals in 2007, and I started off with overhead projectors as well, but I quickly moved on to the use of visual presenters and video mixers as the logistics of doing this were superior to old school analog gear for larger shows. I also started using a computer in my work, not as a main source of presenting media, but as a side piece to accommodate the live liquids I was doing. Um, and you know, and it, I eventually developed the use of a tracing tab, an LED tracing tablet and HD camcorder to make the setups more portable. So here you can see just a very simple flat LED uh, tracing tablet used for drawing, a, basically a copy stand and a prosumer digital camera. Uh, here's some of the more recent advanced uh, gig, uh, rigs that I worked with. These use 4K cameras. We also have the, um, you can see the Roland HD video mixers there, and then on the left side you can see the Resolume, you know, it's a pr popular VJ tool, and, and MIDI as well. And this uh, was actually a rig that Marco Ferrero and I put together uh, where uh, we were prepping for an Allman Brothers show at the uh, Mad Madison Square Garden. And this, I believe, was probably the last big rock and roll light show on earth because this was literally the day before uh, the big lockdown happened in New York City and all across the country. We weren't even sure the show was going to happen, um, but we, we made it through and like literally, you know, the next day lockdown happened all across the, the country and all that. And so this is probably one of the last times like 20,000 people got together to see a big show like this. But this was a lot of fun, and you can see our rig here. On the left side, you can see us with our liquids. On the right side, um, we also have another visual station, that's Jonathan Singer. Uh, in the front, you got um, uh, lighting with, with Christopher Reagan, and in front of that, you have sound. Um, here's us prepping for the show, you know, going over the set list, Marco's prepping the liquids and all that. Uh, here's, uh, here's one from Soundcheck. You can also see us up at the iMag screens on the top of the, uh, you know, on the top where we were being able to be fed to. But for the most part for this show, we actually fed the liquids into a video map mushroom that hung above the stage. Um, and this was quite a bit of fun to do this show. Um, here's a little bit more. And next slide, I think. Oh, there's me at the garden. And 
The next, uh, the next artist I want to talk about is Dennis Keefe, whose work I really admire. You can see him here collaborating with Marco Ferrero there on the left, Lance from Mad Alchemy on the right, and you can see all this crazy stuff that uh, Dennis has developed. He's using cameras, video mixers, but he's also doing live analog stuff on the spot. He's, you know, he's making things, you know, making things alive and all that. Uh, and here, so even though he's using all this crazy technology, at the heart of it is a living, breathing thing that is being projected or imaged to a big screen, uh, to a big audience. Uh, and finally, here's another artist I admire, um, Akiko Nakoyama from Japan, and she does some very interesting work that uses uh, high-resolution cameras, but at the heart of her work uh, is really liquids and uh, organic analog things. Although she's using all this crazy, you know, high-tech technolo technology, really it's the hands-on in time, real live uh, approach to visuals that she is bringing. So I think that's really cool. So there you can see we went from overhead projectors to visual presenters to high resolution cameras and all that stuff and bringing it to big video walls and video projectors. Um, <coughs> so where are we going next? Uh, I think that the use of AI, and I'm hoping to someday use it is that AI will get to the point where I can simply set up a camera and have it watch the screen while I do visuals. Uh, it can maybe look at me and see what I'm doing. It can maybe be connected to some of the inputs that I have on some of the MIDI or the, the video mixing that I do. And basically I would train this AI to learn my light show and sort of have fun with it. Have it like try to approximate what I do, use it as an assistant to me, maybe take over some of the things that you know, I, I, for the most part, do my show solo, so it is, you never have enough hands to do everything, but then maybe have the AI figure out what I would want to do and anticipate that and do those types of things uh, would be really cool. And it would also be really cool just to play around with it. And, you know, AI still seems to be pretty weird when it does stuff, so it would be pretty interesting to see what it does with the work that I do and to collaborate with a machine like this. So thank you for watching. That's gonna <coughs> that brings us to the end of the talk. Um, I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about some doing some demonstrations with some of my gear here. I got some overhead projectors. I got a visual presenter and analog video stuff, and I also have some HD capture and uh, digital uh, stuff as well. And then we'll open it up for questions. Um, so stick around. Thanks. <laughs>